focus, focus up. I'm talking to you, Chalice Jr. You're doing a great job with Gridirons to Goalpost, a new show on the NGBN.TV network. Welcome to episode 42 of the Rubio Method. My name is Chris Rubio. I want to thank you guys for sharing everything on NGBN.TV, the Rubio Method.com, Apple, YouTube, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and even Rumble. Because you can tell we're putting out daily rundowns with Rubios on the Rubio Method, Spotify as well. Uh, we're doing a great job of that. I hope you enjoy those as well. We have a phenomenal show. This is one of my favorite shows. Before even the show starts, I'm going to tell you it's going to be one of my favorite, simply because we're going to deal with three people with phenomenal accents. Our guest, Daniel Amy, is from Louisiana. I really want her to thicken that accent up because it's phenomenal. We've got the doc from Ireland, my favorite Irishman, also the only Irishman I know, and Monaghan, who's got that Minnesota accent. And since he moved back, I'm hoping he really picks up the pace. But before we get to all of them, here's what we're going to be talking about. Three ways to get through a conflict with a friend. Another UCLA food story, huh? Why am I so bad with names? Yeah, it's just, it's it's a gift that I, I don't want. How did the queen and I get married? Dementia in the physically fit. The bayou. Being your true self. Being unapologetically you. All of that and much, much more on today's episode of The Rubio Method. Her name is Chastity. I'm out. Welcome to The Rubio Method. Focus. Focus up. I'm talking to you, Kayla. Thank you for always helping me out with the cruiser's gifts. You do a great job, and he always appreciates them and you. So thank you very much. Welcome back to episode 42 of the Rubio Method. Let's go to Minute with Monahan. Monahan, my favorite cop in Minneapolis. Go. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to Minute with Monahan. We've got an awesome one with you today. And the big thing is we're talking about conflict. Conflict with your best friends, family, whoever is super normal. Uh, and it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen no matter what, but it's how you deal with conflict, uh, which is how you're going to help resolve the issues and move forward and grow tighter as a relationship or with a friends. Uh, so number one is be assertive, not aggressive. Let them know what it is that you're upset about, but don't be aggressive. Don't call names or anything like that. That's going to get you nowhere. Number two is calmly tell them how, where you're, what your feelings are. Calmly tell them how your, you know, your hurt or what it is that the that your feelings are feeling, uh, because that's super important. Because if you don't tell them, they won't know. And make sure you're calm about it. Because if you, you know, start gaslighting or putting it on them, then that's really not going to get you anywhere. And last but not least, this is the the final one. Uh, is is bring a trusted friend, right? If you guys have a friend in the friend group, you guys keep butting heads, and you're like, hey, we can't resolve this. Bring a friend on in, someone who cares about both you guys. Uh, and let them talk you through it because chances are they see it from the high level where you guys are just seeing your point of view. There's your three ways to help you with comp. Nice job, Monahan. Let's re re redo those. Recap. That's the word I'm looking for. Be assertive, not aggressive. Yeah, I agree with that one. Calmly tell them your feelings. If you're a dude, I have a feeling this is a harder one. Danielle and, and I will talk about this later. If I told some of my friends my feelings, I think they would kind of laugh at me. There's a couple that I could, but th th we need to work on that a little bit. Three, bring in a trusted friend. I think that's a really, really good option. So Monahan, great job. If you have any questions for Monahan or myself, you can always email Rubio at the Rubio method.com. Speaking of email questions, here we go. Number one, Rubio, I need, and they capitalize this. I need to hear another UCLA story, food story after your sombrero one from last time. This is Stephen in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Colorado Springs. Very nice area. Terrible airport to fly into. It is very windy and it's right against the hill. And if you do not like flying, do not fly into Colorado Springs. I'll just say that. Uh, another UCLA food story. All right. I got one for you. One of the guys I played with, his name was Josh Eby. Very, very smart human beings. One of those dudes that graduated in three years, maybe even faster than that. And this was before summer school. He would take like five or six classes at a time. He was just a wild man. Super, super smart. Anyway, we're going to this Mongolian barbecue place. It was one of those places where you get your bowl for like eight bucks or nine bucks, whatever it was back then. And you fill in as much meat as you can, as much meat as you can and rice and vegetables and all that stuff. You get still eight just bucks. That's as much as you want. But as soon as it pours over, you're out. So eight bucks, as much as you can stuff in there. So EB, like I told you, was a super smart kid. So he starts getting this meat and he's like jamming it in the bottom. It's like a mortar and pestle. He's just jamming, jamming, jamming like a caveman. All of a sudden he gets all the meat to the top. I mean, it's overflowing. And then he gets some carrot sticks and he creates some sort of like bamboo slash carrot stick wall that goes up above the thing. And I'm talking like 
legit like 12 inches. He wove it. I don't know if he was an engineer in training or something like that, but he wove this wall to look like a, like a mesh wall. And he got, I'm not joking, another probably three to four pounds of meat in there. We get up to the front and the owners were there and they looked at him with absolute amazement slash disgust. And they said, congratulations, you got the most meat. You're not allowed back in here. And he literally got banned from that place. Well worth it. It was phenomenal. Congratulations to you, EB. All right, number two. Rubio, why are you so bad with names? You said you have trouble remembering them, but then if you do remember them, you end up butchering them. What is the deal? Grayson, Madison, Wisconsin. Been to Madison as well. Okay, good town. A lot of cheese curds. Good people out there. I don't know why I'm so bad with names. I I'm absolutely terrible with them. And the more I learn them, the worse that I am. I Daniel, Amy, I even had to text her and say, hey, how do you pronounce your last name? Because it's A-I-M-E. Is it AIM? Amy? And I I'm shocked that I haven't ruined it. If you go back through every episode, every guest, I think I probably got about three right. And it's just one of my things I cannot do. I don't know if there's someone that can help me. That's why I create so, much nick so many nicknames. Put it this way. My house, okay, you have people that have lived here. You have the Queen, Ritz, Damon Dale. Across the street, you have 220, 110, 55, and Pookie. My next door neighbor, you have uh, the Judge and Siesta. That's just within a 50 yard radius of me. So I just come up with nicknames. I get them. I was just talking to one of my friends who's having their daughter is having a kid. And I was like, oh, Rubia would be a great name because it would be a little girl. And I said, actually, name it whatever you want. I'm just going to rename it. So there you go. Uh, number three, the, I was going to do the wedding questions, but I like this one better. Not that I don't like my wedding or my wife. Okay, you can hear me, Queen. I know you can. Rubio, what is the most physical pain you have ever endured? Frank in Miami, Florida. Ooh, good question. Well, I'm a male and I've had a cold or a flu. So obviously that's the highest level of pain a human being can experience. If you've ever seen a male with a cold or a flu. Uh, also, I don't know if my appendix almost burst when I was a freshman in college. And that, that, like I said, I think I talked about that one time where it was like sub 60 Ed was in my stomach with a flamethrower. That was really bad. But I would say not even my back wasn't that bad because it was so surprising. I swear to God, I think the worst pain I've ever had, besides obviously the male common cold and flu, was when I was teaching, I had an ingrown toenail. And if you've ever had an ingrown toenail, okay, so for those that are watching, you can see basically your toenail, it gets sharp and it starts growing into your skin instead of out. All right. And I remember this thing. It's like a jagged piece of glass in the corner of your toe. I have no idea why you get them. I just know you get them. And I remember like a probably a 85 year, 85 pound sixth grade girl stepped on my toe. And I was the closest I've ever been to throwing a human being through a wall because it was absolutely blinding pain. I ended up going to the doctor after that. And if you've ever gone, they numb your toe with shots and you're just happy for that. And then they cut in the middle and then they cut it out. So they like just kind of cheap, like a piece of pizza. I almost got out of it. And when they do, uh, this is what happened for me. Like, Everything started flying out like pus and blood, but it felt like I took the biggest, most fantastic pee in my life. It was so refreshing. That's not the visual you wanted, but that's the visual you're going to get. All right, next up, we got a visit from the doc. Her name is Chastity. Focus. Focus up. I'm talking to you, Crystal Ortega. You make me laugh daily on LinkedIn. Keep up the great, great work. Remember, you guys can follow the Rubio Method on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, NGBN.tv, the Rubio Method.com, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, and Amazon. If you ever have any questions, you can email Rubio at the Rubio Method.com. Let's take it away to my favorite and only Irishman I know, Doc Connor Hogan. Rubio, you could be in trouble because the Lancet Journal, which was one of the most, if not the most respected journals in the world, has looked at what could end up being dementia in a lot of people. And it's seen 33 to 65 year olds have a 72% more chance of getting dementia in their 70s, not 80s or 90s. That's if they work in a medium to high level physical job. If it's physically demanding, even with regard to farmhands or nurses, nurses' aides, retail assistants, that's how physical it needs to be just to get to mention. And of course, that includes those that have thrown a football a lot every day. Believe it or not. 
All right, we're back from Doc Connor Hogan. I love his backgrounds. I don't even know if that's a fictitious background or he just tries to find some Irish cave just to piss me off slash make me happy, but I love his accent. Now we're going to talk about his little dementia is more prevalent and a more physically demanding job in a second because that kind of bothers me. But first of all, let's bring on our guest, Danielle Amy. Her name is Chastity. Bring on Danielle. How do Danielle, you? Danielle, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm double fantastic. Do not hold back that accent. You know, I want you to let it rip. I'm I will so try excited to do about my it. Best. I want it to, I want the accent to be like dripping out of my ears. I want it to be so much that I have like dreams slash nightmares of it. You know, I want the accent out. Okay. So <laughs> who's Danielle best. Amy? She's an intuitive growth mentor. She's an authenticity, authentic, authenticity, that's a big word, coaching for higher achievers. And she's all about helping you break free, find your true purpose, and create an amazing life. She believes that when you unlock your full potential, you can live a life that's raw, real, and unapologetically you. Danielle, welcome. Are you excited for today? Super excited. And I can relate to your ingrown toenail story, minus <laughs> it feeling like a fresh pig. Like... <laughs> But you were relieved when it did. Did you get the where they cut it out and squeezed all the crap? I did. Out? Yeah, and it is some excruciating pain because it is yes. like jagged glass. And if you ever see the piece that they cut from oh, your yeah. toe, it literally looks like freaking like gnarly like razors that's been stabbing you. It's horrible. Like horrible. Yeah, it, it, I'm not kidding. That little girl, that poor thing, she stepped on my foot, and I was like, gonna in my mind, I thought I'm gonna grab her and just throw her through the wall. <laughs> Cause it hurts so bad. It is bad. Yeah. And I've had babies. Well, so like it, yeah. it was actually pretty worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's Okay. See, I've told you. All right. Number one, what, what, let's go some quick hitters, Danielle. What is your thought on what the doc just said about dementia being more prevalent in a more physically demanding job? I mean, I, the, I would say the only thing that sort of stands out to me in the possibility, or not po obviously there's evidence. I'm sure he could prove that yeah. against it, but I mean, I can see how stress can be an inhibitor in physically demanding jobs because mm -hmm. it, the chemistry of the brain is affected. So I'm assuming, just assuming that maybe that has something to do with it, like the overwhelm of the brain and probably the areas that need to be like worked. Um, that's <laughs> uh, maybe aren't really getting what they desire. I mean, otherwise, I, I mean, I find it kind of like baffling. I would have thought the opposite. People sedentary not active, not doing things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Cause yeah. Last week Doc had, had a study where if you're like 50 to 70, you need to go outside and socialize. Correct. And now okay, it's almost like you can find a study. Well, you could do it definitely after the last three years that proves any point you want. So yeah. it's like, I, I'm going to talk to the doc. If I'm going to really have to focus on his accent though. <laughs> Number two, what's the best and worst part about living in Louisiana? Oh, um, Beth, we do have some pretty awesome, flavorful food. Um, cause as I've traveled outside Louisiana internationally or in the States, like people's food is bland as F like horrible. Um, yeah. so I do like that. Otherwise the worst, I mean, it's, it's constantly like, we just got out of the summer of like Satan's hot breath. And then we turned into like Arizona at the same time, like normally we're very moist here. And then it turned very dry. We have shitty looking water. <laughs> it's just it's just not really it's it's kind of like the water kind of depicts everything here like no there's not alligators in everybody's backyard and swamps and stuff you know like some people think that's cool but like it's kind of dirty we're dirty we're like a dirty state like okay. dirty you got a lot of rage towards louisiana but i've been there i get it i, I i've told her name is chastity i i honestly think i'm the first person to be allergic to humidity I don't oh, like Lord, it. Well, you would die here. Oh no, I, I've been I've been to Baton Rouge and New Orleans in w July, late July, Ooh. and like you said, it was like a gold it miner's is. butthole. Yes. it was like the it's devil's exity. Yeah, it, it, it it's the worst thing of all time. Um, I I would have picked the best part about Louisiana, but your food is good, but to me, it's so salty. I mean, last time I felt like I was looking at an MSG popsicle. There was so much salt in it. Your best part to me is by far the accents. The first time I ever went to Baton Rouge and I was telling everyone how much I love accents, but I can't understand them. I, yeah. can, I can understand you because you're not thinking it up yet. But the doc, I have real trouble. Like a lot of shows. I won't watch any shows that have British or English people in them because I, I can't uh -huh. understand them. Even with subtitles, because then I just had a breathing. That's what my husband says, too. Yeah, I'm out. So I, I literally can't. I'm running a camp in Louisiana and they we're doing this roll call and all the coaches know that I can't understand accents. And this kid comes up 
and he is from the deep bayou. I mean, mm -hmm. where the, they're like, you're not sure if they're speaking English or French mm -hmm. or what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I go, what is your name? And he goes, Rawl. And I go, what? He goes, Rawl. And I look at the coach. He's like, oh, obviously, they're playing a joke on me. And I, he goes, mm -hmm. Rawl. I go, spell it, man. He goes, R O A A or Rawl. I go, what? He goes, Rawl. R O A A E, Rawl. I go, for the love of God, write it down. <laughs> and so he writes it down. And I go, are you trying to say Ronald? He goes, Ronald. Oh, God. R O A. And I go, you know, you're allowed to use your tongue, man. And so that's the accents for me would have never be number one. All right. Third and last question for you, Danielle. If you could sit down and have a conversation with anyone, obviously besides me, who would it be and why? Hmm. Good question. Um, hmm. So that's interesting because like, there's not many people like that. I find interesting enough to talk, not in an egotistical way, but no, there's an author that's like from years ago. I mean, he's, I don't even know what year he died, but like this dude's thought process, his name is Joel joel goldstein mm -hmm. and he's like this author that like i don't know talks about like life so differently and i've read a couple of his books to where like i'm like i wish i could sit down with this dude and just be like but what about this situation like i mm -hmm. get this perspective but what about this like i've always been a questioner so i don't know i would love to like talk with that dude like and see what he said even though he's dead but i can do mediumship so maybe i can line that up one day okay we'll talk about <laughs> that a little bit later too i'm glad you didn't pick the the director or writer of that movie your favorite movie i watched it um with the one with Robin Williams. Oh, what dreams girl. may come. What the hell? That movie takes you on a roller coaster. Sure does. I've never saw, saw it, seen it, saw it. I never, I never saw it. And then I watched it just two days ago because I was like, okay, I got to get some background here. And I'm like, I felt like I That's was on like I 97 mushrooms. And I was like, this is like the saddest movie besides the, the beginning of the movie Up. And then all of a sudden <laughs> it goes to this other part where Cuba Gooden Jr. is like walking around naked, sort of like as Mr. Jesus or God. But then it turns out to be, I don't want to give away too much, but thank God that that is a, if you've never seen, what was the movie again? What Dreams May Come. You got to be ready to watch that physically and mentally. It's definitely not for everybody. Like I watched this like when it first came out. Like I may have like I don't even know what how old I was. Like I was pretty young because my dad was always into weird shit and like it always like always thought it was cool. Uh -huh. And I don't know. It it's still to this day. The very first time I watch it, I watch it and I watch it and I watch it. And I was like, I I don't know what about it. I think it's because of the depth and like the complexities of life, which most people don't want to dive into because like my dad shared that movie with his mm -hmm. sister, who's kind of closed minded back in the day. And they were like, Oh, like I didn't like that. That was just mm -hmm. horrible. And it's like, yeah, cause it's different. And if you're kind of closed minded about stuff, it probably won't be very receptive, you know, but like, I've yeah, always and, been kind and, of curious. and I'm not giving away too much, but it ends on a, on a high note. It does. All right. So look, which it took a while to get there by, for the love of God, but we it finally <laughs> got there. The whole scene with hell when he was stepping on the faces, too. I mean, I was like, what the hell? Like, I, I thought to myself, the director's obviously hammered. Like, there's no way you come up with this. All right, let's get to the real part of this here. I'm going through your website, which is phenomenal, by the way. I'm going through your LinkedIn. I'm listening to your videos. I'm doing all this, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Are we lost? Are we long lost brother and sister? Are you and I? Because your life principle, and I swear to God, I could have wrote this. Your go-to life rule, be unapologetically you. Forget the fluff and the shoulds. If it feels right, go for it. If not, ditch it. Life's too short to be anyone but yourself. That's how I roll, and that's how I help others roll, too. I could have literally wrote that myself. So are, are we long lost brother and sister or not? Quite possibly. I mean, because this this is very weird. Tell me, how how did you get this overall attitude? Um. So, again, kind of ironically playing off of this movie, not in the literacy of it, but like I said, it's kind of different. Well, there's just something that I'm going to clear my throat. <clears throat> no worries. Sorry. Um, something about I've always questioned everything and I've never really felt like I used to be able to blend. Like I was an athlete. I did all this stuff like in school, but like there was something about me that was always like a little bit different. And so like I always like questioned stuff and I started to realize like how many people around me was just simply fake ass bitches, men, women, you <laughs> name it. And everybody's people pleasing. And I experienced it inside of my family with my mom. And then like, as time went on and I realized like, I get this choice to like do something for myself, which was actually like right around like graduating high school, uh, like around, I don't know, um, early twenties, I guess I started to question things. And then I'm just like, fuck this shit. Like, why do we spend so much time worrying about what everybody else is thinking? Everybody else is doing, because it seems like everybody's pretty much miserable most of the time or complaining about life or in places they don't want to be. And so that just sort of spun me into like this curiosity of not saying yes to everything, but not necessarily saying no 
Um, mm -hmm. To where, like, for example, the Alzheimer thing of I'm not saying that it's factual, but I'm not saying it's not factual. But I also believe there's so many sides to so many stories or like you said, you can go on Google these days and find five scientific studies all leading yeah. to five different freaking answers. And I think at the end of the day, the answer that matters is the answer that sort of relates best for you. And that takes you in the direction where you want to go. And so that's just sort of been my premise of like working with people or just being a person. And, and that's kind of where I just get it from. I'm just tired of the fake shit and I'm honest and I'm real about it. And I think that actually benefits people instead of the whole, like, is somebody upset? Is somebody's panties in a while? They're always going to be somebody. Yeah. There's always somebody. Well, and, and that you exude a lot of confidence. That's where I think you and I are very similar. Um, you've obviously got much better hair than I do. But how, how, when did this confidence start? Like, was mm -hmm. it you? I, obviously, playing sports. If you're if you're doing well in sports, you're going to have a lot of confidence. Was it a parent thing? Did it, you? At one point, did you just say, "I'm done with this shit. Let's go." Yes, actually, it was because it's, it's quite opposite. I spent, ironically, I wore a lot of mask. Um, I was able to blend in a lot and. Mm -hmm. I've always had a pretty good personality and that's what people liked. Um, and that's where I think it let me, let me, I use the word survive because um, my youth and my high school years were some of the darkest years of my life. Like I actually spent majority of my life suicidal. Um, I'm 37. <laughs> so if somebody's like, how old are you? And you say majority of life, 37. And most of it, I actually didn't want to be here. I wasn't happy. I wasn't confident. I hated how I looked. I didn't think I was smart. I didn't think I was going to amount to anything. I felt below average or semi-average. If I was good at anything, I didn't take it. I didn't allow it. And so then, yeah, it was, again, kind of going back to, I think it was around 19, 18. My dad, I think, vicariously lived through me in the concept of he started to give, my dad died. So if I talk on past tense, he died in 2021. Um, and he gave me this gift. I think that he couldn't give himself is the opportunity to be someone else, be yourself. Mm -hmm. And he was always very different, but he didn't have the confidence and he didn't have the courageousness to try to pursue that because it's different from everybody else. And so when he started to notice me question things, I noticed he backed me. Um, mm -hmm. so he himself had none. Um, and I didn't necessarily always believe him, but it started with just small things of starting to recognize the thought process I had towards myself. Um, I took sarcasm as something to be like funny, um, you know, light making conversations light or whatever. But when I really started to analyze my sarcasm, I was usually completely like kicking myself on the ground over and over and over again. So that was like my first step into this. And then, yeah, once I hit like my early 20s, um, I took well, this is another story, but <laughs> um, oh, I guess it was like actually, no, my late 20s, um, I eventually was led to go do ayahuasca in Peru which is a whole other story of what that is and all this shit. But at, around that stage in my life, it was like my mid twenties. I remember having a conversation with my husband. We're maybe married two years, been together about six at this point. And it was just like, shit or get off the fan. Like this depression shit isn't working. <laughs> this sulking isn't working. Like go do something, go do something different. And like from that moment on, I made a commitment to myself that nobody's fucking getting in my way. Nobody's going to like at the end of the day, when I go to die, nobody's lived my life but me so why do i care about what people feel like you yes. know i mean we can care in the sense of being respectable or taking in consideration of something but we are not mandated to listen in form of taking it on as an action that we must follow and i just kind of just unapologetically said fuck this shit and here i am you know <laughs> and it gets yeah. stronger and stronger each year you said something that i say all the time and my uh, my friends and family like God, I can't believe you said it. And it's it's not a big thing. But what I say is like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, well, what if they don't like, I, I, I don't care. Well, what, 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 what are you doing? Where, I, I, don't, I don't care. And mm -hmm. it's it, when I've done speeches for big corporations, I'll, you know, bring that in towards the end. If, if you don't have the, I don't care attitude, where if at a hundred people in that crowd, 80% love me, but 20% don't, I don't care. <laughs> they, they lose the 80% yeah. win. And if you mm -hmm. don't want to love me, that's fine. I'm an acquired taste. I get it. But if you, you don't want me, that's fine. Is that the same way you, you basically what you're saying? Yeah. And in fact, to me, um, I've grown accustomed to the concept of I sort of want them around. I don't want everybody to like me because I then have to question myself if everybody say there's 100 people in the room and everybody thinks I'm amazing, like everybody loves me or loves my personality then am I masking myself to make these people like me? Yeah, Not saying no I have to be hated. But when I'm really, truly myself, no matter if it's a family member, a friend, or even a client, I sometimes 
you know, get people's panties in a wad, not to intentionally be mean, but when I'm genuinely myself, because I can be very blunt and direct, not everybody likes that. Um, I can offend someone or trigger someone because of their past. So I think it's a part of being human. We're not here to please people. And we're not here for people to please us. Like we're here to please ourselves. Like, and then that seems so selfish also, but it's actually not selfish. We live in a world that basically tells us to stay away from who we are and like almost shame that. And I think that's just insane, like insane to get like shunned because you question things or shamed because like you trying to like love yourself and care about yourself, not an egotistical way of like not showing up to pick your kids up because you got a tan. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> But so I don't know. It's just like I, I think embrace all of it. Embrace the haters. Put your little hater shades on and be like, fuck it. You know, obviously there's something you you like about me or you actually wouldn't be watching me. You just That's can't stand I, that I trigger something inside of you and you refuse to look at what that thing is. What is gonna, it that you can't stand about me? Because yeah. I ask you to turn it around, reflect it internally and go examine that with introspection and you'll learn a lot about yourself. And then I usually lean into it more. Yeah, That's, it will find it when I find out someone that I'm going to give you a phrase that you're going to put into your holster. And if you've never heard it, you're going to use it a lot. Two tears in a bucket. F it. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, pew, pew. Yeah, yeah. I, I use that all the time. OK, what what do you do? Like We've kind of danced around a little bit. What do you what, oh. what is your job? Quote unquote. Sell yourself My to me. Interesting. Um, I, my husband, even like as much as he knows everything about me and was one of the very first people to experience this. Um. I'm interesting. <laughs> so uh, it's, I always joke with like people around me. Like, I wish I could just say like, I'm a social media manager. I'm an accountant. I'm a, you know, plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't ask for what I do. And that's another thing that's really weird. In 2017, what I do came to me, which is I'm really gifted. I'm very gifted. And I used to be very skeptical about this. And when I say gifted, I can talk to the dead. I can, I can read people's inner child trauma. So meaning I can go back into people's past and pick up like traumatic elements and traumatic things. Sometimes not even trauma, just emotional feelings. I can feel suppression. Um, I can feel the present moment. And I also can feel the future. And what I do is I often, not always, often work with those that have gone to therapists like over and over again and tried all these different things and they still feel like they're like plateauing out or they're not really going further or i like to call it there's this inner thing that just feels like something's off like on their path and they don't really know what it is because most of my clients have made a lot of money checked a lot of boxes gotten a lot of things i call them high achievers and i once was one of those people checking boxes trying to you know go to this level like before i got into all this i did business consulting got my masters in business and i thought that's where i was going to go in life um and in 2017 my life changed it's like god universe whatever the hell is creating us or whatever you know showed up at my door when i'm on a business retreat and i read a stranger who i didn't really know other than her name like her entire life and then she looks at me and she's like danielle I've literally like prayed for you. She's like, I've spent over $75,000 like between rehab, therapists, all this stuff. And she's like, you were able to like give me what I needed. And I'm like, you're welcome. Um, so flying home on that plane that day, the summer of 2017, I looked at my husband. I'm like, I don't think my life's going to be the same. And since then, my husband is a, a war vet, a uh, Marine from, you know, has PTSD from war. But he also, I started to realize like working with a lot of military that has, PTSD from war, their PTSD didn't really start in war. It was exacerbated in war. And then mm. I started to realize more and more as I learned from him and as well as talking with his counselors and VA through the VA. Um, and they taught me a lot about the human mind. And it started to fascinate me in the concept of in, they feel entrapped, like humans feel trapped in their mind and in their thoughts. And I'm able to get into the thought, vocalize how people feel, which then makes them feel heard. When they feel heard, they feel safe. When they feel safe, they're more inclined to explore. And then the depths of themselves begins to heal. So I've helped keep many, many veterans alive um, for years, including my husband, and to get to places to where they don't look at themselves in the mirror anymore as a monster. I've helped women heal from traumatic rapes and captures. And I mean, literally had some trapped in chains in a dungeon, not really a dungeon, it was a basement, but called it a dungeon. You know, like I've had some stories and, and not everybody's story is so, so dark like that. And then I have those that feel they had a life that they shouldn't feel pain or shouldn't have struggle because, you know, mom and dad was married or just something basic. They got divorced, but nothing happened. And I'm like, just because nothing physically happened to you doesn't mean that somewhere in your mental state, 
that you didn't feel loved, you didn't feel wanted, or you just don't like yourself. And I think that's what is really trying for people in this mental health field, because I guess that's where I'd label myself. Mm -hmm. I'm in mental health in an alternative fashion. And I work really well with those that are with therapists because I have the gift to find the roots, the tenacious roots that just keep lingering. I can do it very quickly. No need to dick around. Like, let's get to business. Let's talk <laughs> about it. Um, and I don't look to work with people forever. Like, I don't want to work with people forever. In fact, I've let clients go, not because they're horrible, but I'm like, fly the nest, little birdie. You know, now we got to work on uh, codependency. <laughs> you don't need me to grow. And <clears throat> so in short, when people have that mentality, especially if you've done healing and you've done these things, and I wanted to actually speak on this, so I've kind of tangented it a little bit, but I know in the men's network, there was someone in the last few months that is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to speak on that note as a person that has been working in this field, um, not because I think I'm a therapist for the people that get triggered by that. You might want to go look up that just because you can pass a test doesn't mean you know anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that just because you know something and just because you help somebody in a field of say mental healing doesn't mean that you yourself don't still require it. And doesn't mean that you're not going to have days where you might not want to be here anymore or that you still feel alone. And then you feel like you need to put your Superman cape on and act like everything's okay. We want you to know that it's okay not to be okay. And there are many times since 2017 of doing this that I've had some low moments after I had my second kid as much as my stubbornness and A-type personality wanted to be like, oh, nothing's wrong. I had some horrid ass postpartum depression and was in a really, really bad place. Um, and then I had one other time after I lost my brother-in-law and my dad, like in a period and all kinds of other stuff was going on. I didn't realize I got into depression again. Um, and again, like we have to be able to be comfortable with ourselves talking about this and realize that just because you're in a dark place doesn't mean you're inevitably like done. Like, there's always a window of opportunity and that reflection is waiting for you to see it within. And um, hopefully that <laughs> answers your question in a very long winded story. It's just, it's so, and it's never really an easy answer. It's so layered of what I do, but it's also interesting because it's kind of how it is, you know, with what I do. No, that was fantastic. And like I said, I, I felt like I was listening to myself talk because you talk as fast as I do. I do talk fast. Sorry, everyone. That is slow. They, 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 can, they, can, they can drop it down to 0. 0.75 or 0. 0.90 or whatever it is in the, the podcast speed. Um, but it was fantastic. Um, I, I want to go back. There's, I have like a 1,300 questions, but I don't want Chastity to start yelling at me about the time. Tell me more about the psychic part. Like, and you yeah. said, you okay, so you, you live in Louisiana. Do and, and say someone from California wants to book a session with you. Mm -hmm. You can do the psychic thing through the phone or th through Zoom, or do they have to be in contact with you? Like, no, what's the I deal have, there? my clients have been worldwide Scotland, Australia, in Canada, um, all over. Um, the very first encounter, so since I was a child, I was intuitive in the concept, I knew when people were lying. Um, I didn't know I was though, like, I didn't know I was gifted. I just would mm -hmm. always be like, you know, why don't you tell me this? And my mom be like, how do you know that? And I'm like, I just do. Uh, like I just do. So I was always very like hyper vigilant. And then another thing that was very odd for me to where even adults would tell me this when I was young, they would confide in me about stuff like all kinds of people or my school guidance counselors. Like you're very wise for your age. Do you know that? And I'm like, I guess, you know, so it didn't really add up. And then eventually I meet my husband around like 2009. And then I'm, I'm like able to pick up, like I call it my little feelers. So I'm like, oh, that, you know, person, no, backstab you. And he's like, you're just being jealous. And I'm like, well, you'll find out. And then turns <laughs> out, right. You know, so stuff like that started happening. <clears throat> and then, yeah, my gifts came in in 2017. I didn't even know this, this shit was possible. Like I was, I wasn't really a very religious person. I wasn't atheist, but like I grew up Catholic, but didn't really practice it. And I questioned it and didn't understand all of it. Like the whole rule and order. And there's all these perspectives kind of goes again, again, five scenarios, which one's true. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, when the gifts came, it was like, oh, God, uh, felt a little awkward about it because I'm like, I'm going to get stoned. Everybody's going to think like I'm a fraud and a liar and all this stuff. But it started with reading a stranger. So she was in person and I did touch her arm. <laughs> so at first I was like, am I ever going to be able to do this again? Am I supposed to have a gypsy sign in the window? Yeah, you're, you're whooping over from the ghost at this point. <laughs> do I need a crystal ball? And then it turns out, no. Um, and I had an acquaintance of mine that was like, she's also psychic and she's like, Hey, yeah, like you do realize you can do this. And I'm like, I think you're lying. She's like, tell me how I feel. And I'm like, I don't know. She's like, tell me how I feel. And I'm like, well, you got a lot of anxiety right now. She's like, all right, keep going. And I kept going. She's like, damn girl. She's like, you go pretty deep. And I'm like, do I? Cause I feel like I'm guessing, you know? So I had to like bend and flex that, like build my stamina 
with intuition. And then it just got deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I was able to talk to my dad when he died. I talked to my brother-in-law the day after he died. He apologized to my husband. It was a very emotional event. Um, and yeah, I work, I don't have to touch you. I don't have to see you. And I've even had people give me a false name, um, to where I'll do audio reads where they're not like video and I will still read them to a T. I don't need to see you. I, I just feel you. I can feel you from anywhere. Wow. That is amazing. Okay. I've got a billion more questions. I'm going to have to have you on for a part two, obviously. <laughs> where, can people, where can people find out more about you and your program? Um, you can go to DanielleAmy.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-A-I-M-E.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I post a lot of content. I have some content also on YouTube because I try to give, as I call it the buffet, I give a lot of information out and a lot of information is available online. Um, but you're going to get overwhelmed a lot of the time. You're going to make a lot of the wrong choices, even though I still think they're right because you're learning. Um, you get to learn who you are. But if you are looking for a quicker, like, hit, not hit it and quit it, but like in a way, um, <laughs> in a good way, yeah, um, you. you can come in, you know, and and I do free sessions also. I do 30 minute call them curiosity calls. And I have like a joking picture of me wearing like a cloak. I do not wear a fucking cloak, but it's a joke. <laughs> Um, as well as I think it has a crystal ball somebody made because people mock me for it. So I'm like, that's cool. You can mock me. I'm like, or, you know, people's like, oh, can you tell me what I had for lunch? I'm like, no, but I can tell you what you did your wife. Would you like me to tell everybody about that? You know? Um, oh. so, you know, um, but anyway, yeah. DanielAmy.com is where all my stuff is. Find me on LinkedIn. I post there regularly. Got lots of content, lots of free stuff to help you help yourself and kind of unmask all these layers that hide the real you. All right, DanielleAmy.com. It's D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-A-I-M-E.com. It's a very, very solid website. I was perusing it yesterday. That's a big word for me, peruse. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, Danielle, this was absolutely phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Make sure everyone checks out the website. You are a very, very interesting person. Uh, it could be because you just sound like exactly like me, but that's, that, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> thank you once again. Her name is Chastity. I am out. This is NGBN TV, a network for men and home to top experts, speakers, authors, and more. I'm Chris Rubio of The Rubio Method. I'm Charles Wallace of the Bear Essentials Podcast. And this is Bud from the Sports or Gibberish Podcast. Streaming TV for men, created by men. Hello, my name is Ian Hill, and I have the tremendous honor of being the CEO of NGBN.TV. We are so excited for you to join us on this journey helping us build a television network for men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. I am NGBN. I am NGBN. I am NGBN. I'm NGBN, and so are you. Join our movement at NGBN.TV, coming January 2024. Focus. Focus up. I'm talking to you, Emily, out in Post Falls, Idaho. I thought you did a, an absolutely fantastic job on a slideshow. You know what I'm talking about. You incorporated everyone, and that was not an easy thing to do. Welcome back to episode 42 of the Rubio Method. My name is Chris Rubio. Thank you for subscribing and sharing on NGBN.TV, therubiomethod.com, Apple, YouTube, Spotify, Google, Amazon. And if you have any questions, you can always email Rubio at the Rubio method.com. Thank you to Danielle, Amy. That was absolutely intense. Fantastic. She talks as just as fast as I do. You probably sound sounded similar because she, I swear she's just a female version of me. We got, I'm going to check DNA at some point on this one. All right. Now we've got the bottom line. The bottom line for all you new listeners and watchers is all the stuff you should have learned without even realizing you learned it. Here we go. Number one. Be assertive, but not aggressive. Be clear and bring in an additional friend if needed. This is, goes right back to the minute with Monahan. You're going to have some conflicts with friends. But remember his three tips on how to get over those conflicts with friends. Number two, you are who you are. Deal with, deal with it and create new ways to embrace it. This has to do with the fact that I cannot remember names. And so what's my way of embracing it? I just create new names for everyone. Do they like it all the time? Eh, what are you going to do? But I am me. Which brings me to my third one. Do not apologize for being you. Daniel, Amy obviously expressed this over and over and over and over and over. And I loved every single second of it. She's all about making you a better you and not apologizing for you as well. Remember, you can check her out at danielamy.com. This was an absolute fantastic episode. I got to hear 
one, two, three, four good accents. You guys can't hear her name is Chassis, but I can in the back. Make sure you guys continue to subscribe on all the major out, uh, podcast outlets. Have a great week. Chastity, I'm out. NGBN TV, a network for men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, coming January 2024.